So one of the surprising things, one of the many surprising things for me as a roboticist about the Xenobots project, and in this case, is where is the tape and where is the machine? So is the machine the Xenobot? Is the machine the swarm of Xenobots? Is the machine the cell? Where's the tape? Is the tape the genetic instructions inside each cell that makes up a Xenobot? You could probably argue for and against that. T to me, at least, it's not clear that there is a clear distinction between tape and machine in the current self-replicating Xenobots. So we're already in the land of non-intuitiveness. It's not really clear how things operate in this design space. Just talking about um, the, the Josh was mentioning the, this this fractal nature. This is uh, it, it's a little known fact that um, some of the complex rules by which uh, large things like limbs, like like salamander limbs, for example, regenerate. Those same systems were seem to work very similarly in single cells in regeneration of single cells. I think I think biology really exploits this kind of uh, fractal thing in reusing the same physical principles again and again. And most probably, all the processing power that had gone into letting cells have really intricate, proper shapes. In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles, where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about the research. Thanks Science Robotics for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. Maybe before we start, if you can just simply uh for the audience, maybe I know everyone know about the robots now. It's very, very famous and popular. But in a more, more from biological perspective and from robotics perspective, what is actual xenobots? Maybe from biology, if you can make it a simpler definition for Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so from the biological perspective, uh, I think that uh, xenobots and biobots in general are a new uh, class of model systems that are teaching us about. Uh, really important aspects of morphogenesis, of evolution, of the relationship between um, genomes and anatomy. So, so basically what, what happens is you take cells, in this case, uh, skin cells or epidermal cells from a, a, an early frog embryo and uh, set them aside in a new environment where you've basically liberated them from the normal instructive interactions by which the rest of the cells are telling them to have this, you know, sort of two-dimensional boring life on the outer surface of, a, of an embryo keeping out the bacteria. And we can ask questions when they are released from those constraints, what else will these cells want to do? And it turns out that they get together and they form this little uh, self-motile creature, which we call a xenobot. Um, and it has a number of behaviors. It is able to self-heal from certain kinds of damage. It is able to, uh, it, it moves around, of course, and uh, it, it uses these little hairs called cilia, and, and by waving them th and, and swimming through the medium, it, uh, it has all kinds of motile behaviors. It, uh, they, they, they interact with each other. They interact with aspects of the environment. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the fact that they, they undergo this uh, kinematic replication uh, kind, of, kind of behavior. And um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a minimal proto organism uh, con consisting of cells that self assembled into this new shape. Mm -hmm. And from a robotics point of view, obviously the nickname for these new model uh, systems are xenobots or biobots. So there's the bot in there, um, and there's an interesting discussion to be had about whether these even qualify as uh, robots. Personally, I feel that we can view these uh, systems as robots because they do useful work or interesting 
uh, work autonomously. And they were either built by us, built by a human microsurgeon, and or built or designed by an AI. So they've been created in some way to do something that's potentially useful. And in that way, they qualify uh, as robots. Uh, xenobots and biobots also sort of continue this progression. You can see over the decades in robotics from traditional rigid robots made from metal and ceramics and plastics into this new era of soft robotics, which obviously your podcast is all about, which really tries to pay attention to the materials from which we build our autonomous and adaptive machines. So we've gone from rigid robots to soft robots, and we're now entering this era of biological robots, of which the xenobots are kind of an interesting example. Mm -hmm, great. So I'm curious how you thought about self-replication um, after the first paper. Can you tell a more story that you decided to investigate the self-replication? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the 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 whole series of early papers, and there there are going to be a few more, are all about, to my mind, are largely about understanding their emergent behaviors. So so before we get into uh, really trying to program the morphogenesis, program the behavior by putting in, you know, ultimately we'll be able to put in new synthetic biology circuits and nanomaterials and scaffolds and all this other stuff. But before you can do all that, I think it's really important to understand the uh, the basal properties of, of this incredible um, active medium. And so, so to really understand what do these cells do? And so the discovery of, uh, of, of this replication was at the, to, to me a complete, uh, complete surprise. And it's not anything that, that we knew in advance was going to happen. And it's one of many things that we've seen that is, is surprising about these things. And it's just, uh, it, it has many implications, I think, but, but, but it's, it's one of a class of, of us, uh, basically it, it's, it's the kind of work you would do with any new model system. You know, if somebody gave you a new kind of uh, animal or a new kind of creature to uh, to investigate, you know, and you didn't know about it, you would you would sort of put it through its paces and see what it does. This is this is that this is this is a kind of uh, zoology, I think, uh, for, you know, this new new model system. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Josh, maybe from the robotic perspective, since you highlighted exhibiting intelligence through the morphology or the body. For you, which one is more significant, the material, which is here, the living cells or the structure, which lead to maybe interesting behavior, but firstly, which one is significant to you? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I understand correctly, what, what's more important or more interesting, the material properties or the, the physical structure? Yes. I, I think, again, it's not either or, it's, you know, all of the above. Um, you know, we're all of us trying to create in the long term, you know, intelligent and adaptive machines, which are maybe part of us or apart from us. And whatever this relationship is between physical structure uh, material properties, cellular communication in the case of xenobots, you know, neural communication, neural based cognition, neural based behavior. All of these things are intermeshed in a way that is much, much more complicated than I think was uh, envisioned at the early, in the early days of AI and robotics. Wh whatever the final answer is, there is no clear demarcation between body, brain, material, genes, phenotype brain, tape, machine, all of those distinctions that we've kind of relied on in AI and robotics, and I guess biology as well, the xenobots are, are you know, doing a good job of demolishing those distinctions. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting, this correlation between living cells and the shape or morphology and self-replication. And this is really interesting part, but maybe before going that, what's actually self-replication, just if we can break it down from biology and from robotics and simulation. So what is actually self-replication is? Well, the, the, one of the uh, basic aspects of living things is that in order to uh, be, become observed by, by some observer, um, you, making copies of yourself is an excellent way to persist into the future, right? So as we, in biology, our, 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 one of our goals is to explain the things that we see in front of us and, and the creatures. And so, so, so lots of living things, uh, do this not by persisting for extremely long amounts of time, but actually by making copies of themselves. And there are many different ways to do that. So there's, there's kind of internal development, the way that you see in mammals and, uh, and there's budding and there's fission and there's, um, all, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of types, all kinds of ways to, to, uh, make copies of yourself. 
Uh, it, as it turns out, these Xenobots do something, as, as far as we know, entirely unique in the, um, in the, in the uh, animal and plant kingdom, which is they manage to make copies of themselves by moving around and gathering loose material, meaning other cells, into little piles, which then themselves become Xenobots. And in doing so, they basically recapitulate exactly the way that we make them, which is that uh, as much as we, when, 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 uh, when, when, when we make these Xenobots by pushing them into piles, but not uh, micromanaging what happens after that, we are, it's a sort of collaboration. We are taking advantage of the fact that the cells themselves have certain competencies, right? They're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So, so the AI tells us, tells us uh, that maybe we will need to sculpt them in certain ways. And then Doug will, you know, sort of uh, manipulate them in specific ways. But, but the cells do a lot of the hard part, which is to get together and to form this, this coherent moving agent. And what they do is exactly that. They, they run around and they collect these other cells. And then they don't micromanage that that process. They uh, they let the other cells do uh, do the next generation, do exactly the same thing. Get together, undergo morphogenesis, make a uh, of of um, make an, uh, the next generation of bots. So it's this it's this uh, multi generational collaboration process where you're you're building with with really active, really competent materials. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask Josh here. I think was interesting about. How you figure out the shape that can maybe uh, do the self-replication or hold as a design and literally come in with Bickman shape at the end. But maybe I'm curious to ask you what kind of maybe characteristic do you, did you think the very necessary for you to come up with this design in the AI design tool? Can you tell us more about maybe the behavior? What's actually was the key point to figure out this uh, the final generation would be Bickman shape, for example? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So as you hinted at, um, the there's two parts here. There's the xenobots themselves and the competencies all the way down in those xenobots that Mike just uh, alluded to. The challenge for the AI is how to guide that self-organizing competency at multiple levels to get whatever desired behavior we want. And in this most recent paper, the target behavior was self-replication. So I I wanted to just talk about self-replication from the point of view of the formal sciences. So actually the idea of machines producing copies of themselves, you can actually trace that idea in Western literature back several hundred years. It was sort of a vague idea. Um, And if you fast forward to the 1960s, John von Neumann actually sat down to try and formally define what is What do you need for a machine to self-replicate? Those have since become known as von Neumann machines. They have remained mostly theoretical. Um, There's a few roboticists who have have built self-replicating robots out of more traditional parts. So the xenobots kind of fit in with that line of inquiry. One of the things that's interesting about von Neumann machines, as they were originally uh, formulated in the 60s, is that there was a distinction between the machine and the tape, the thing that formally encoded the machine. And the machine would obviously have to make a copy, not of itself, but of a copy of the tape and put the tape in the copied machine with enough fidelity that the new machine could continue on. So one of the surprising things, one of the many surprising things for me as a roboticist about the Xenobots project, and in this case, is where is the tape and where is the machine? So is the machine the xenobot? Is the machine the swarm of xenobots? Is the machine the cell? Where's the tape? Is the tape the genetic instructions inside each cell that makes up a xenobot? You could probably argue for and against that. To me, at least, it's not clear that there is a clear distinction between tape and machine in the current self-replicating xenobots. So we're already in the land of non-intuitiveness. It's not really clear how things operate in this design space, which is why it makes sense to bring in an AI to try and design simulated xenobots that self-replicate in a simulated Petri dish and then see whether we can take those simulated self-replicators and realize them in reality. You mentioned the the shape. So that obviously became the most important part in this project, which again, in retrospect, I think is surprising that we, that we focused on the shape and the AI was able to come up with a shape without micromanaging, as Mike mentioned, micromanaging the internal cellular dynamics of these xenobots. And that was sufficient in this case to produce self-replication. 
I come from a, a, a line of academics who have focused on this idea of embodied cognition. The body matters. I think, you know, the, the Pac-Man shaped self-replicating xenobots are a great new poster child for this idea of embodied cognition because we had no access. We, as the human investigators and the AI, had no ability to program these xenobots by altering genes or manipulating nervous tissue. There's no nervous tissue inside these xenobots. The only medium that the AI had to play with was the body of the xenobots, the shape. And it turns out it was able to find a shape that produces the desired behavior. So I think it's just another nail in the coffin of this idea that brains equal intelligence. Mm -hmm. Great. So I want to go again, why certain shapes, for example, whole self-replication, or do they make success in that case? If you want biology, what's actually happening when we have different shape, like as you highlighted, some shapes, what doesn't work and self-replicate? Can you explain more what is happening here? Well, the the, the this the, the, the thing to keep in mind is this is a, a a minimal. It's a very minimal system of self replication, so it doesn't have many of the bells and whistles that uh, that that very complex biological systems might have. So, for example, one thing that we don't yet have is uh, what, what might be called strong heredity, where the the bots have very clear individual properties. And uh, their offspring resemble them more than they do others, and, and actually they may. We we don't know. We don't. We you know we we don't know that that's true yet. So we don't make that claim. But but at the very least, what we have is a uh, a minimal system where all of the bots uh, run around their environment, and they have this kind of um. Uh, they tend to do this kind of circular motion. They can go straight. They can go in circles. They have a variety of different motions that they do. And the circular motions tend to act like a, like a sort of like a sheepdog where it, if they find loose cells or in fact any kind of loose, um, small objects in their environment, they tend to corral them into piles and uh, they move, uh, between piles, across piles. Uh, but, but basically they will, they will spend some time circling this pile and sort of smoothing it out and pushing it closer and closer, you know, t t tighter and tighter into the center. Um, and then eventually those cells themselves will undergo exactly the same process that, that the very first generation of Xenobots did, which is they compact, they, uh, they, they attach to each other and they, um, sort out, uh, their, um, the, 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 the angling of the cilia so that the system will move in, in particular ways. And, uh, and that process is repeated across multiple generations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, maybe in the design process between the Josh group and yours as well, it's kind of maybe disagreement sometimes in design or maybe, I don't know, something was maybe not intuitive in the design process. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, in robotics, there's a lot of focus on sim to real, right? Model-based control, simulated robots, physics engines. How do we get stuff from virtuality into reality? One of the things that's interesting from a robotics perspective, you know, when you're working with living tissues is actually real to sim. So what do we know about the current, what, what do we currently know about the biology of xenobots? What do we not know? How do we incorporate that into the AI design process to maximize the probability of sim to real success, right? So there's this... In the actual co uh, collaboration between my group and Mike's group, there is this slow outer loop of sim to real and then real to sim. And, you know, at the moment, this is still kind of ad hoc. It's, you know, Zoom meetings, us learning the biology, Mike's group learning the robotic side and, and figuring out how to keep this cycle going. I think one of the future implications for, you know, interfaces between biology and robotics in general is how do you... How do you systematize this loop, this outer loop? How do you automate going from sim to real to produce useful biological robots? And then how do you go from real to sim to learn more about biology and re-energize re the next generation of biological robots? And around and around you go. Mm -hmm. Is there something maybe missing, uh, I don't know, in explaining certain phenomena and the, and the result for you? Do you think still missing? There's understanding lot, what there's lots of things that are missing, right? I mean, I think the xenobots just show that we have a lot to learn. 
One of the surprising things is despite all of our uncertainties about what's actually going on in the Xenobots, we can still achieve in some cases, and again, as Mike mentioned, this is a very minimal system, under certain conditions, we can still successfully cross the reality gap. We can achieve AI-driven design of biological robots, despite a lot of our uncertainties about the biology that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And for biology perspective, I don't know if you're simply missing also for you, for Mike, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. There's there's way more missing than there is a thing than there are things that we already know. You know, this is this is just the beginnings of a very deep uh, set of questions. For example, one of the things that remains to be uh, probed in detail is what are the different competencies of these guys, both at the cellular level, uh, at the subcellular level, and at the at the collective level, because the kind of intelligence that we're all interested in is a, a competency in navigating all kinds of problem spaces, not just behavioral, but also physiological, uh, transcriptional, uh, morphological, uh, metabolic. There are all sorts of spaces in which life solves problems. Only, only the behavior is obvious to us because, you know, all our senses sort of point outwards. And so from our, from our childhood, we're really primed to recognize agency and intelligence in other creatures running around and doing things in the three-dimensional world. But there are um, tons of other kinds of intelligence and competencies that are done by your organs uh, daily, by your, by your various uh, cells and tissues. <clears throat> and we just are now starting to uh, ask questions about what are the, what are these uh, what are these creatures actually capable of? What are they sensing? What are they measuring? Do they have preferences? Um, how sophisticated are their uh, protocognitive capacities? Can they learn? If so, what kind of learning can they do? These are all completely open questions. We don't know anything about it. And uh, a lot of people make assumptions about these things because, well, they don't have a brain or they're just skin, uh, which are which are completely unwarranted because the field of basal cognition is telling us that. Uh, Every time when, when we make an estimate of the IQ of some other kind of creature, we are in effect taking an IQ test ourselves. Because if you're not smart enough to recognize what it's doing in some interesting space, then you're going to miss it. And I think we are just at the start of being able to truly recognize uh, interesting types of agency and intelligence and in, like unfamiliar um, substrates like this. Mm -hmm. But I, maybe I want to ask you again, in that case, do you think that maybe you highlighted before how each cell is communicating with each other to create the organ, sh organ shape? Do you think this could help in understanding the morphogenesis, how they communicate and want to stop grow, and this is the right shape in morphology? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think absolutely. I, again, without without yet making a commitment to um, how much uh, complex morphogenetic control there is specifically in, in Xenobots, because we're not sure yet. But uh, what we are sure of is that in, in, uh, in embryonic development, in regeneration, in cancer, in all of these cases where control of anatomy is really a primary um, driver of what's going on, uh, we really, as, as a community, we really do not understand very well the algorithms that drive these things. We're getting better at the hardware. So genetics and molecular biology are pretty good at telling us what hardware the cells have. So what signaling molecules, what uh, receptors and, and, and gene regulatory networks and all of these things. But actually, uh, how the collective makes decisions about its path through morphous space. Um, we, we really don't understand that very well at all. And I, I have great hopes that synthetic models like Xenobots are going to be very useful to uh, crack these kinds of um, generic uh, principles of, uh, of, of morphogenesis that um, are really sometimes obscured by traditional model systems that have had you know, millions of years of, of very precise shaping and a lot of frozen accidents and so on. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to Josh again in the simulation part. And you mentioned sometimes simulation may be abstract. So for you, that simulating the environment lots of morphology and this behavior. What's maybe here missing about um, in the aspect of simulation? And for the environment, can you tell us more about the environment when the Petri dish is different from other environment? What are the conditions here? Yep. Maybe so, missing for you. Yeah, exactly. So as Mike mentioned, you know, we're just at the beginning of this, this technology. So when we sit down to create an appropriate simulation or model environment for these xenobots, <laughs> we're stymied about what even the environment is. So, you know, Mike mentioned some of our human biases. If you ask somebody what environment is, they'll tell you outside, the stuff that's, you know, outside of me. But that's taking, that's taking, that's making a big assumption, which is the self is the overall organism, is, is me. And everything else out there is the environment. But of course, 
the self is a collection of cells in which each cell has its own environment, which is the cells around it and the extracellular matrix. If you zoom inside a cell itself, there's a rich environment inside a cell. So there is no clear distinction between self or the xenobot in this case and the environment. So if we sit down to make a simulated Petri dish and simulated glass beads inside a simulated Petri dish or simulated dissociated cells inside the simulated Petri dish, we're making huge assumptions about what the environment is. And those could be completely, that could be completely wrong. So I think, again, it's not so clear when we sit down to create a model of the xenobots and their surroundings, their internal and external environment, how to actually go about modeling that. How rich an intracellular or intercellular environment do we need to simulate in addition to the normal macro things we put in, the Petri dish, the fluid dynamics, the what, what have you. Mm -hmm. So maybe I want to ask you, Mike, from your perspective, what's more significant to you in the whole process? that you think need more exploration from biology perspective? Is it a morphology or something else that you understand? What's more significant to you, do you think? Well, I think uh, big picture, the most significant thing is the, is the, uh, the scaling, as, as Josh was just saying, it's the scaling of the self. So the, uh, every, you know, in a multicellular organism, every, every cell is some other cell's external environment. And, uh, you, you really have, we, we really have to understand how these individual competent agents scale up things like, like, uh, stressors, preferences, goal states, memories to a scale that's much bigger than, than what any individual cell can, can achieve. So this is the, the normal process that happens in embryogenesis, right? Where we all start life as a single cell and eventually we scale up to a system that is able to have these you know, really grandiose kinds of goals that are much larger than, than anything that single cells can do. And, uh, that, that scaling of, of, of these kind of competencies, I think is, is, is really, you know, kind of the grand mystery of, of a lot of biology, philosophy, um, you know, other, other fields as well. I just wanted to, to continue on with this, this interesting topic. You know, if you look at self slash environment, it, it seems increasingly that it's fractal, right? There is an interesting feedback loop between self and environment all the way down. And the, the more I learn about Xenobots with, you know, working with Mike and, and, and his staff, the more I realize that, you know, we, we have really understudied fractalness in robotics. If you go to Google Scholar and type in fractal robots, next to nothing comes up. But it seems, you know, there's so much going on in living systems, as Mike mentioned, at all scales. A lot of those things are self-similar. Some are dissimilar. There are variations on themes as you scale up and scale down. And none of that has really been touched in robotics. We have modular robotics for a long time. A lot of in interesting things going on in modular robotics. Some modular robotic systems are hierarchical. Um, but I would argue there are little to none that are fractal. I think this is, again, another open frontier uh, in robotics and in, in biobotics. Mm -hmm. And what other aspect do you think building this part in Shinkin Robotics to consider designing a living system as a robot here? What other aspect or hot question do you think still not really touching maybe in the what you do or you're still thinking about? I would say a big question is, as Mike mentioned, multi-scale competency. How do we make machines built of machines built of machines? where you have self-environment interaction, you have sense, think, act loops, you have things that look like agency going on at all these different scales. And what should those, what should those patterns look like at these different spatial and temporal scales? None of this has really been investigated very well uh, in robotics. Part of that, I think, is we just haven't been able to. We've lacked the materials to create things that operate, that do interesting things at different scales. We focused on, you know, one machine, it looks like a human, it looks like a dog, close the sense, think, loop act, or close the sim to real, the real to sim loop, but it's all at one level. How we do this simultaneously at many levels, um, again, is, is really challenging, but I think an exciting thing to think about from a robotics perspective. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Mike, maybe I'm curious about the correlation between the morphology and cognition, intelligence, and scaling. Do you think it makes difference how the cells, the shape, and the cognition or intelligence behavior. Do you think yeah. there's a correlation here? 
Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's a deep relationship, and and my, my conjecture is that uh, what evolution do, one of the things evolution does is to pivot the same tricks across different spaces. So whereas modern uh, advanced animals uh, are able to um, use their nervous systems to solve problems in three dimensional space and to navigate those those kinds of uh, strategies and those competencies come from much earlier. Uh, kinds of uh, kinds of creatures that were using the same strategies to navigate other spaces, for example, morphous space, the, say, the, the, the space of possible anatomical layouts. And this is one reason we study bioelectricity, because uh, long before brains and neurons showed up, cells were, were forming, non-neural cells were forming electrical networks that could store memories, that could take measurements, that could do simple computations to manage the shape of, of the organism. And before that, we had individual cells that were uh, using some very similar processes. It's actually amazing how, you know, we were just talking about, um, the, the Josh was mentioning the, this, this fractal nature. This is, uh, it, it's a little known fact that um, some of the complex rules by which uh, large things like limbs, like, like salamander limbs, for example, regenerate, there's this interesting clock face model rule, this positional, um, uh, uh, this, this positional information kind of system. Those same systems were, it seemed to work very similarly in single cells. In regeneration of single cells, so some some single cells are highly patterned. So things like stentor or paramecium, you know, they're they're not just shapeless amoebas. They have very intricate patterns, and they're able to regenerate those patterns. And the errors they make in doing that look very much like the kind of errors that are made by very large systems. And so I I really do think that biology um, exploits, and there are many other examples. I think I think biology really exploits this kind of uh, fractal thing. In reusing the same physical principles again and again, and most probably all the processing power that had gone into letting cells have really intricate proper shapes later on got co-opted to uh, into letting them um, navigate three-dimensional space and make you know make shapes out of actions and and those are to, to me those are those are probably very closely related. Right. Yeah. So maybe building that, I want to ask Josh here. If you really want to push the limit of the shape of the morphology, since in the paper, I think it was five generation to reach the shape. Can you tell us more about if we ask what other shapes, what are maybe, maybe advances you have to do in the algorithm or the AI design tool to figure out what other shape, what other possibilities that can self-replicate? Yeah, so in the paper itself, we showed this Pac-Man shape. And this, again, this minimal system, simple system, was able to achieve at maximum five generations of self-replication before the process kind of runs out of gas. Again, we gave, we sort of, um, we made things hard on the AI. The only thing it could do is play with the 3D shape of the progenitor xenobots, the generation zero uh, xenobots. But of course, we could, as we start to learn more and, and build up some uh, instrumentation, we could allow the AI to play with different aspects of the Xenobot's self and environment. So instead of designing an individual Xenobot, maybe the AI designs a pair of interlocking Xenobots. So imagine two, uh, two Pac-Men that are kissing and the mouths overla overlap so that they kind of lock together temporarily. We've actually seen some of this in the in the Xenobot swarms. Given their 3D shape, they will temporarily stick together and rotate about their common center of mass. That seems like you know a great starting point for creating more complex shapes, more complex forms, and more complex function. So I think again, as we start to scale up the ability to design and manufacture and control and guide the self-organization of xenobots, the AI will be able to explore, you know, much more interesting spaces of possible form and function. Mm -hmm. So since you mentioned the shape was an interesting aspect to make self-replication, I, I want to ask you because it, it, it's written that it is not genetically modified, not genetically modified. And I'm curious if there's other aspects, do you think, beyond the living cell, cell, the morphology, do you think other aspects can achieve self-replication? Or maybe other interesting behavior, maybe not explored. Or are you still thinking maybe if I alter something, I don't know. I'm just curious. Beyond the morphology, uh, do you think other aspects could contribute instead of replication? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not sure. We, we're not sure yet which of these aspects will be specifically in, important for self-replication. But just in general, there are many modalities that 
uh, evolution uses besides uh, genetic material. So, so one that we are particularly excited about, for example, is bioelectrics. So, so all cells are able to form electrical networks. I think evolution discovered a really long time ago, around the time of bacterial biofilms, that electric networks are really great at coordinating information across space and time, at storing memories, at making decisions, and so on. And uh, we haven't even yet begun to seriously uh, uh, study and manipulate the um, the bioelectric signaling within the xenobots, right? As we have in, in embryos and regenerating um, uh, regenerating animals and cancer and so on. We've done a lot of work on that. The, all, all of this still remains. And then, so so there's the bioelectric angle. There's the biomechanical angle. Uh, you know, we're um, we've got a collaboration with uh, Don Ingber and some other groups at the VIS. Um, to look at, uh, look at biomechanics in these, uh, in, in, in these xenobots and, and really start to get a read out of the physical forces that are, that are happening within and across the cells. And then, of course, between bots themselves in a the group. So, and that's just for starters, right? There are lots of other, in biology, there are, you know, ultra weak photon emissions. There are chemical gradients. There are, uh, probably lots of different modalities that we don't even, you know, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of. Mm-hmm. And for the aspect of regeneration, because I think one of the question, I think in robotics, for example, using bionics or cyborg and versus regeneration. I don't know what you think about regeneration in that aspect. Do you think we are capable in that case? Because I think there are some group really trying to regenerate, for example, parts of the hand. Maybe from biology and robotics, if we can. Do you think about that as well? I'm just curious about this aspect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, there's a whole portion of my lab that is um, devoted to regenerative biology and and trying to drive applications in regenerative medicine. Um, we uh, we're working on limb regeneration. We've uh, more or less uh, solved it in frog and are now uh, moving into into mammals. And uh, the idea will be that all, all the way from so so there should be a whole spectrum of uh, of capabilities all the way from improving, for example, improving the, the, the stump after an amputation to the point where biorobotics and prosthetics can be, can be better integrated with it. So this is, you know, we have a, we have a, um, David Kaplan and I have a spinoff a company called Morphoceuticals Inc. where we're looking at, uh, limb regeneration specifically. So it's so all the way from that down to, uh, the final goal of being able to regenerate the limb and hopefully other, other organs by uh, by by basically the kind of collaborative process that we see in the xenobots where you don't try to micromanage it you don't try to dictate the lowest level of gene expression or of 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 cell uh, patterning you are basically giving it large scale signals that will um uh, uh either 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 push or incentivize the collective uh, to to uh, build uh, specific structures within within the possible morphous space for that cell group mm mm-hmm. mhm so maybe yeah, go just yeah. So re- I think regeneration is also interesting from a robotics uh, point of view. If you're dealing with you know traditional rigid robots, regeneration is simply not an option. Um, myself and others in soft robotics have looked at you know injured soft robots that regenerate lost limbs. Actually, Mike and I have a collaboration with Rebecca Kramer Botiglio uh, at Yale, and our three groups looked at this. Um, and especially when we're talking about biobots, re- regeneration becomes an option. Um, if you're a damaged robot and you can't adapt your behavior and you can't regenerate, maybe you can create an undamaged copy of yourself that continues on the useful work um, that you're supposed to be performing. So again, I think if you go from uh, rigid to soft to biological robots, one of the things it's forcing us roboticists to do is broaden our conception of the possible actions that an autonomous machine can take. And those actions are not always reprogram your own brain or learn to do something differently. You can make creative use of your body and brain to perpetuate your own pattern and your own utility forward in time in a way not that dissimilar from what Mike was mentioning that biology discovered billions of years ago. There's lots and lots of different ways to propagate your own pattern forward through time. Mm-hmm. Maybe I want to ask you again, Josh, here about the functionality, for example, self-healing was already, is, is this come for free, but from robotics and materials, do you think there's something here maybe missing, how, how we can close this gap since these features already for free come in the living tissues? And maybe, I don't know, from soft robotics or materials or rigid parts, yeah. 
Well, I think Mike can correct me. I, I wouldn't say that regeneration comes for free in living systems, right? There is a real, there is a literal and figurative cost that comes with regeneration. It is one strategy among many for how to continue perpetuating form and function forward in time. Which of those particular strategies, including regeneration, makes sense for a robot, given its morphology, given its behavior, given its task environment? Again, I think it's it's non-obvious. From a soft robotics perspective, you know, there's interesting energetics questions about regeneration compared to adapting your behavior. Now self-replication is maybe an option as well. You know, if you're an intelligent machine, which of these options you choose under which circumstances is not clear. And again, I think is an interesting open uh, line of investigation for robotics moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So maybe I'm curious for maybe other big questions. Do you still think for the next uh, Xenobots? I don't know. Besides self-replication, what other features do you think may be interesting for Xenobots? So I think uh, from a robotics point of view, I mentioned this already, this slow outer loop of sim to real and then real to sim, um, thinking about how to automate that process. How can we accelerate the biology? How do we accelerate the biological knowledge that we can squeeze out of xenobots and biobots and this whole new, this whole new uh, zoo of model organisms that we're trying to create? How do we distill out that biology and feed that back into robotics? Robotics from day one has always been inspired by nature. By nature, bio inspiration runs throughout AI and robotics, but it's always been manual and ad hoc. We see something interesting in nature and we try and build it into a robot or code it into an AI. How could we distill and embed these biological principles automatically? That would be real to sim with a capital R. Um, that's something uh, I'm really interested in working with Mike and others on as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Mike would like that something. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, especially excited about uh, just just uh, radically opening up the space of possible living agents. So, so one can imagine uh, varying every every part of this, right? Which which cell types, what kind of materials they encompass both both biological and um you know all kinds of smart materials nanomaterials uh all of the environments in in which they can be placed uh, different different cell, cells of different origin in terms of chimeras um of course synthetic uh, synthetic biology circuits bioelectric circuits incorporating uh closed loop kinds of controls where you let the bots control their own environment um, in terms of uh, j just uh, letting them uh, <clears throat> letting them be part of um, letting them be part of, of a computerized system and, and, and electronics, all of that is is to me incredibly exciting because I think we're going to uh, have the chance to it's it's almost um, it's almost it's almost a step towards exobiology in a way right because you get a chance to, to 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 learn from alien creatures that have never been here before that no one's ever seen that don't have the same kind of a, a f fixed lineage in um, in 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 the evolutionary uh, history on Earth, and uh, I think we're going to find uh, lots of interesting things that we had no idea about from just studying standard evolved model systems. Mm -hmm. Maybe for the application part, since it's mentioned, could be used for treating malignant tumors. Can you tell us maybe the future steps of how it could something that could work in human body and potentially, for example, eating or maybe. Yeah, self-replicating in the human body. Well, I want to say two two things uh, about that. Um, the the key the key is that there are there, there are two classes of, of applications here. So there are there are applications where you're specifically putting the bots, presumably um, uh, uh, human compatible bots, into into a patient, right? Where they're going to do things. Also, perhaps um, in vitro, where they're maybe sculpting tissues for transplantation. You know, micro microsurgery and, and things like that. That that's that's one class of application. And there, you can think about everything from uh, 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 scraping plaque off of arteries, chasing down bacteria, uh, uh, smoothing out arthritic knee joints, um, dropping pro regenerative molecules. Uh, just just an incredible n number of applications. But the other thing that's also important to realize is that not all of the biomedicine is about using the bots directly. 
The indirect usage of the bots is to use them as a kind of sandbox platform to learn about morphogenesis. So by the time we get to the point where we can tell the cells of a xenobot what shape they should all be working towards, at that same time, we will have the large part of a solution for regenerative medicine in the patient that has nothing directly to do with xenobots, that we would basically be able to use that knowledge, use what we've figured out about um, how cellular collectives can be managed to uh, dictate uh, specific outcomes, complex anatomical outcomes in patients. And this might be, you know, yes, maybe, maybe xenobots are chasing down individual tumor cells, but also what we learn about why cells make a, a, a body rather than a tumor, right, uh, can be used to normalize. And this is something else that, that, that we're doing at the moment is using um, bioelectric interfaces to try to convince cells to, instead of going rogue and undergoing metastasis and tumor genesis and so on, to remain connected to this electric network that tells them to be part of a proper um, uh, uh, histogenesis or organogenesis cascade. And... Uh, you know, so so there are kind of d direct and, and indirect uses. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask Josh here again about closing the gap between biology and robotics. What do you really still need to learn or know about the, so so that you can have maybe other features you you, you want really to have it in the future generations? But what's re really for you? You still need to learn or understand. It's still mystery for you since you're still in higher level. So as Mike mentioned, the end game here is learning how to guide morphogenesis to various end target, uh, various target forms and function. How do we bring an AI into that game? What are all the different physical, chemical, electrical, biological knobs that an AI can, can tune to guide morphogenesis towards a useful biobot or a recovering human patient? Um, that's obviously a very, very big question. Even if we can figure out which knobs the AI should be turning, obviously setting those knobs to certain settings are extremely dangerous. Um, they're useless. They, they cause lots of problems. So how to even set up this how to even set up this enterprise? How do we allow an AI, to gradually enter into this business of fiddling with living materials. There are intellectual questions, legal questions, ethical questions. You know, th this morpho space of all possible living systems, aliens, xenobots, you know, everything that's existed on Earth, it's a, it's a near infinite space. But we need to, from a practical point of view, we need to take intelligent steps through that space. We can't try things willy-nilly. We can do that in simulation, obviously. With physical, you know, technological robots, non-biological robots, we can also be a little bit willy-nilly. But when we're fiddling with living materials, we need to be careful from lots of different perspectives. And, and what that actually means, how to actually do that responsibly um, and in an intellectually interesting way are, again, open questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe because we're going to end a few questions, the most exciting moment maybe in this project, uh, if you can share sometimes frustration, doubt between uh, both group here, do you have this moment that sometimes is doubt or, yeah, and maybe exciting moment if you can share it here. Yeah. So for, for me, there was a clear, it, most interesting moment. There's been lots of interesting moments, obviously. Um, when Mike's group and mine first started to work together, uh, we were funded by a DARPA project. And like all interdisciplinary research projects, we had to learn the other side. So we had some weekly Zoom meetings and we would show the Levin Lab what we could do in simulation with robots. And the Levin Lab would show us what they could do with living tissues. Um, Sam Kriegman, uh, my PhD student at the time, showed some of our uh, simulated soft robots. He showed a particular quadruped one week. The next week, Doug Blackiston, the microsurgeon uh, that works with Mike, came on the Zoom call and showed us something that had been built from frog skin cells that looked exactly like one of Sam's simulated quadrupeds. And I can't speak for Mike, but the moment I saw that image that sort of started started the floodgates of what could be possible with biological machines. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, for me too, you know, when I, when I first saw them 
running around uh, on their own and, and, you know, no, no brain, just, just skin liberated from their normal context, doing this thing that it never, that, it, that there was never any evolution for. Um, I, you know, I, th- I thought this would be very exciting, but, but not until I saw the, the real merge of the, of the computational part, right, with what was going on, that it really hit me that this is, we, we, that, that we really have a chance of, of solving morphogenesis here because, we, we, you know, human developmental biologists have been at this for a really long time, and we and we've made good progress on a number of on a number of things, but we don't have yet the kind of tools, the kind of software tools that, for example, molecular biologists have. So there's um, there are all sorts of bioinformatic tools for uh, uh, for sequences, for DNA sequence, for protein sequence, for RNA. They have all these tools to do interesting things. There are no there there are yet are really no. Um, uh, bioinformatic tools for, for, for shape, you know, for bioinformatics of shape, and this and, and, and seeing this 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 um, kind of tight integration of of the machine learning with this novel synthetic system, where you're not just uh, finding new ways to break an existing uh, an existing system to see what goes wrong, but you're actually building them from scratch. That now sounds to me like a cycle that once we really, as Josh said, automate it and and really get it going, that sounds to me like the most powerful way to to crack this problem. So um, I would have to say that's the that's the the, the linchpin. Great. So I want to ask you, since uh, you already made a huge success, and but I want to know if there's disagreement and critique that you receive it as well as this huge success. There's been abs. There's been absolutely no disagreement or pushback from our scientific colleagues or the general public whatsoever. <laughs> That's <a> great. <laughs> Everyone loves it. <laughs> Everyone loves it. There's no disagreement whatsoever. That's great. <laughs> okay. I'm obvious. I'm obviously joking. There is. <laughs> you you name some aspect of this project, someone's got a problem with it. No, for sure. No. Okay. I, I will leave this part. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> good no. good last question good last question no okay so what what makes you fulfilled what makes you fulfilled both of you I, I one of the things that makes me intellectually fulfilled or satisfied about this as mike is mentioning is this is just this is the end of the beginning this is just cracked open this whole new set of interesting questions there's more than enough here for you know Mike's and my professional career, so I'm I'm excited to see what you know our collective students and postdocs do. We get emails from you know little kiddos who want to be xenobiologists, xenoroboticists. You know there's there's so much here for our for Mike's and my generation, the genera- intellectual generation after that, and probably the intellectual generation after that. Um, you know, science is super hard. Um, you spend all day, every day in the lab, and it seems not only you make no progress, but often you feel like you're going backwards. So it's nice to sort of crack open this new vein of questions you can possibly ask and see the next generation getting excited about the kinds of questions that they want to pose and will be able to try and answer in the years to come. That that makes me really happy. Wonderful. And for Mike, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I I agree. I th- I, th- I mean, I think I think it's very exciting to see to see the next generation. Um, in, in particular, to see the next generation uh, n- not have trouble grasping some of the same things that in prior um, in prior uh, generations have been sort of calcified these old categories. You know, this goes back to your question of what what are people complaining about? I mean, th- there are certainly things people complain about and. Some of it really has to do with the fact that we've gotten used to certain categories. Like people look at this and go, that's not what a robot is supposed to look like. A robot's supposed to be metallic and clunky. What are you talking about? And so, you know, all of these terms that, that Josh mentioned at the beginning that, that we thought we had good definitions for, you know, robot, machine, and people love to say, ah, living things aren't machines. And then, of course, the molecular biologists say, no, absolutely cells are machines. I mean, look, look at all the, all the, you know, the stuff we can understand rationally about how their parts work. And, um, these, these categories that are, that, that we thought were sharp binary categories that are completely dissolving. I think, uh, the young people, uh, have far less, less problems with this. Um, people, people that are raised in more interdisciplinary sort of intellectual environments have less trouble with this. Uh, and, and I really, I really like that. I really like, um, the fact that, 
uh, we're going to eventually get down to what's essential, right? The, what's essential about robotics isn't what you're made of or how you got here, you know, evolved versus design. That's not what's essential. And, and, and I like getting down to essential, um, meanings of important terms in science and getting past limitations that were just, uh, they were they were just due to our technological uh, limitations of of the time. They made sense it's, at one point. This all made sense, you know, decades ago. But but now we can we can sort of burn off these kinds of um, really contingent factors that don't really mean anything and get down to the to to what's actually important about this. And I, I it is and 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 so to me, I'm really interested in in what this can tell us about really the the, the deep questions of life because we are all collective intelligences, right? We're all bags of cells in an important sense. And trying to understand what it is that we are and what's it like, you know, what's it like to be a collective of cells uh, joined towards a common purpose? Well, we all know because that this is what it's like, right? Um, and, and just that, that whole, you know, the, the fact that this project touches not only on biology and evolution, but, but also on uh, philosophy of mind and these kinds of, these kinds of questions. I, I love that in parallel with what I hope will be, and the other thing I really like is, what I hope will be a uh, positive impact on, on biomedicine because we get, uh, you know, I, I, I get an incredible number of, of people calling me every week with, with just unbelievable medical situations and all kinds of medical suffering. And, and, and really they're all waiting for, for definitive uh, um, transformative progress in regenerative medicine, not just the kind of patch up stuff we have now where, you know, in old age, you get some really heroic, uh, you know, interventions that sort of keep you going a little bit longer, but, 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 but actual, um, foundational improvements that let us have a healthy body, a healthy mind for long periods of time to be able to, you know, sort of exercise whatever potentials we have to do good things. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm extremely excited about that. Wonderful. So maybe the last question for both of you about the vision. And I think what I really admire about you and Josh that you have this kind of vision to to tackle re- fundamental question and very interesting and scientifically rich. And I think, to be honest, uh, that's my point of view. It's not really common. Um, yeah, there's a great research, but I think to pushing this limit is very interesting. I'm curious about the vision. How make sure you're going in the right direction? What does it take to make sure you're really advancing and asking real question as already Mike mentioned that such at many aspects here. But what does it take to have this right vision to keep going and make sure you're asking the real question and advancing? So I, I don't know about my own vision. I, I know about my own formal training. So I was very lucky in retrospect to have some great advisors. Uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, Rod Brooks, Philip Husbands, and Inman Harvey at Sussex University. And I think it was just pure luck that I managed to come into contact with with these thinkers who, you know, they they deliberately worked against the intellectual grain at the time. This goes back to what Mike was saying uh, about, you know, assumptions that made sense at a certain period in time. All of my, you know, intellectual mentors, they worked actively to try and unearth what were the assumptions at the time in AI and robotics. And what other ways, what other weapons, what other tools can we use to demolish those assumptions and try and do things differently? And I think just by osmosis, I've tried to absorb that and pass that on to my my students. You know, what else can we do in AI and robotics aside from sort of the common things that have been studied? What else is, is out there? And again, I think in retrospect, a lot of that was just luck, but I would... I would counsel the the young members of your audience here to really sort of think for themselves as they're watching a YouTube video or a TED talk or reading a paper for the first time, what are the unspoken assumptions underneath that talk or that idea or that paper? And what else could you do? How else could you get at whatever problem is being mentioned? Um, and I think that's that's the way to move forward in science and and become successful, unearth things that people that were unexpected. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know that there's any recipe for guaranteeing that you're going in the right direction. I mean, this is science, and the more um, novel things you do, the less guideposts you have, uh, to, you know, to tell you that you're on the right direction. But I, but I think there, there are a couple of um, heuristics, and I, I, think, I think Josh pulled out a couple of really good ones. Um, I, I like a few others. Uh, 
the, well, there's a, I'll, I'll start with a funny one, which is uh, somebody, somebody once said that um, what you learn from video games is that when you run into a bunch of new enemies, you know you're going in the right direction, right? So I think, I think uh, yeah, you know, you, you, sh- you should expect that uh, significant discoveries are going to face resistance. If nobody's in any way perturbed by what you're doing, it's probably not terribly um, innovative, right? And so, and so w- one thing that I think is important is... Uh, what I what I what I tell my students is is this: when you talk to other people, even very successful, very you know, very um, uh, very very uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, smart people that are that are uh, have moved a lot of uh, of impact. Uh, anything specific that they're telling you in terms of a critique of, of of your experiment, you know, whatever that that's gold, right? You should you should pay very careful attention to that because that's your that's your um, opportunity to improve your science. But meta advice that they give you as far as what you should do, what you shouldn't do, how you should think about things, I, I, I think uh, I, I think really smart people that are and the successful people are very well calibrated on their own ideas and on their own field, and they often are poorly calibrated on your ideas and your field and things that you know. I think it's very important for people to develop their own intuition and get to the point where. Even after everybody else is telling you that that uh, this is uh, you know this is this is crazy this is never going to work this is not the right way to think about it blah 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 if if you know what you're talking about and you've put in the hard work of listening to the specific critiques to make sure that you've got the you've got the details right after that it it it's all on you and you should really not take very seriously at all um, what the what what the limitations uh, might be from from what other people say I, I I've um, there was another quote I read just yesterday somebody said. The, the, the people who think they can't and the people who think they can are both right. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot like that. It's there, there's a lot of negative advice out there as far as, oh, don't do this. That's, you know, that can't be right. No, th- that tends to not be worth very much. Um, that, that's, that's what I think. It's what you have to develop your own intuition. Um, but being, being very well informed and then developing your own view of, of what you think nature is telling you. Great. So I don't know if you have any final thoughts or words from me from robotics and, Biology, if you can, Josh, final thoughts, words, yeah. I think I would just reiterate what Mike said, especially in the history of AI and robotics. You take any given era and everyone was convinced this is the right way to do things. And neural networks, for example, will never work. Um, it's especially AI and robotics. We're trying to create intelligent machines, something that humans have never done before. So it's an engineering exercise where we really are pushing into the unknown. And I would, I would be very uh, skeptical of anybody's confidence about how we're actually going to achieve AGI or human level robotics or whatever the end game is. Um, is to really pay attention to, you know, the nuts and bolts, as Mike was mentioning. Make sure your math is is good, your coding is good, your engineering is good, and then let your ideas guide you from there. Great. Mike, any final thoughts here? No, just, well, just, just to say that I think that uh, for, the, for, for, for people getting into this field and for young people, I think you can you can take uh, you can get a degree in biology and go through all the courses and have a pretty have an idea from all the textbooks that hey we've got this under control things are we we understand what's going on this is a mature science uh, things are going well and I want to tell people that that to a large extent this is a function of it's a selection effect of things that we understand ending up in the textbooks and that there are many examples that are just glaring. Uh, black holes in our knowledge that um, that you can you might never hear about going you know going through these these uh, you know standard standard courses this is this is it's really the wild west it's it's the beginning of of uh, of, of massive adva- advances in our knowledge this is not um, some kind of uh, incremental advanced stage or some sort of linear stage we are we are just at the beginning of hopefully what's what's an exponential increase in our understanding. So again, thanks so much, Josh and Mike, for, yeah, it's really interesting. And I wish you more and more great success uh, what you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much, Thank Marwa. You.